Hello chaps and chappets, and welcome to a historical storytelling of the Kriegsmarines Sheath Geyser now. Now, today I'm going to be talking and looking over the history of the German class battleship. Now, of course, this is going to be a rather large bone of contention and ruffle a few historians and officers' uh, feathers a little bit, but... It is a battleship. Germany classed it as a battleship. America classed it as a battleship. It was really only the English that classed it as a battle cruiser. So it's a battleship. It's a battleship. Although it, it did have some of the characteristics of a ba battle cruiser, i.e., it had very good speed. Uh, more speed than most battle cruisers, in fact. But it was extremely well armoured as well, like a battleship. Uh, the ship was built to be upgunned as well, so it had the option of being upgraded too, but that, that's a little bit for a little bit later in the video. So let us start this story with the basics of the KMS Gneisenau. Um, she was the second ship to hold the name, the prior being the SMS Gneisenau, an armoured cruiser from 1906 that was sunk uh, in Scarpa Flow after the defeat in the First World War. Now she was named after August Wilhelm Antonius Graf Neidhardt von Gneisenau. A, uh, a rather long name, but a uh, very very poetic name, very flowy name, very interesting name. He was a prominent f Prussian field marshal uh, who was key in the reformation of the Prussian military back in the Napoleonic War, or the War of, uh, War of not War of Independence, the, uh, I've forgotten the name of that war now. Um, he was also a vital part in the victory at the Battle of Waterloo, where he was part of the flanking action which helps decide the fate of the Napoleonic campaign. After the battle uh, had stopped, he led the interception of the French Emperor's carriage as well, and saw that his forces reached Paris first before, uh, before General uh, Wellington. He gained a lot of fame from this. Uh, he, he gained the position of Field Marshal, which is a very good position to be in. Uh, it led for him receiving the highest honour as well, the Order of the Black Eagle. So he was very, very famous in Germany, and a very famous part of Germanic history as well. Now we know the name and all the stories behind it, let us start to talk about the ship. On the 14th of February 1934, the ship was laid down in Kiel, taking place of the proposed D-class cruiser, Erz Hassan. Uh, the Gneisenau was the second ship of the Scharnhorst class uh, of battleships, a treaty ship built under the imposed tonnage of 35,000 tonnes, and started the whole rearmament of the German Kriegsmarine, really, after the Treaty of Versailles. The ship was to replace the aging pre-dreadnought uh, class battleship Hessen, who was from 1903, and one of the few German ships, capital ships, they were allowed to keep as well. Oddly enough, the ship actually survived her replacement and ended up being captured by the Soviets at the end of the Second World War. She was in service until the late 1960s, uh, before she was scrapped, so yeah, real shame she got scrapped in the 60s, it would have been lovely to have another pre-dreadnought class battleship in the world. Anyway, with a length of 235 metres and a beam of 30 metres, this made the ship only slightly smaller than the famed Bismarck which would come after it, uh, just a little bit by length and beam, beam being only 5 metres. The ship was protected by up to 350 millimetres of belt armour, 95 millimetres of deck, and a hefty 360 millimetres of the turret face armour. It was uh, well protected, if not being the heaviest of armoured vehicles, uh, ships on the sea, it, it was very well protected. The other thing this vehicle had was free, stern, uh, free steam turbine powered uh, engines, and they were powered by 12 high-pressure oil-burning boilers, uh, which gave the ship up to 151,800 uh, standard horsepower, moving the Nair 39-ton ship at top, uh, when it was fully loaded, of course, to a top speed of 31 knots, that's 57 miles per hour, making it one of the fastest capital ships of the time, and one of the fastest capital ships out there, really, a very, very speedy little boat, well, little boat, giant ship this was. Gneisenau had 
uh, teeth to back up her speed as well. Originally planned to be armed with the also called infamous or famed 380mm gun, which would later be found on the aforementioned Bismarck, along with her sister ship, the Tirpitz. However, Germany was not ready to build these guns at the time. Their infrastructure was still being rebuilt from the First World War. They still needed to get their industry ready for this. Hence, they had to use the smaller guns for their ships, which were the 283mm, now you know, 3mm makes the difference, 280mm SKC 34.9 guns. And these were a quick firing uh, weapon system, which were favoured by the Admiralty at the time because of their superior accuracy, which could lob a 300 kilogram shell 19 kilometres. Uh, it was to sit in three turrets, two forward, one aft, along with uh, an impressive secondary range. Now, there was actually three guns per turret with these turrets, so you had a lot of firepower at hand. Now, the secondaries were made up of 12 150mm guns, 14 105mm guns, 16 37mm guns, and she had six torpedo tubes on board, three either side. So, a very heavily armoured ship this was. Now, in May of 1938, Gneisenau was launched and started the sea trials needed to work out for bugs of all new ships, of course. One major flaw was found with the ship rather quickly, as the crew in the bow and a turret ended up being extremely wet by the end of the trials. The bow sat too low, and in high seas, breaking water would just lap over the ship. This was not helped by the fact it had a straight bow as well, which was very common for German ships at the time. Now, it was a rather common for large capital ships to have this issue. One instance that springs to mind is the deck of HMS Hood, uh, which was well known for being a very damp and miserable place and full of water. It would often flood and cause issues for it. Uh, this issue on the Gneisenau now led to a slight redesign once it came back to port, and they replaced the straight bow with an Atlantic bow. Now, instead of a straight bow, the Atlantic bow had a slight curve in it, well, a slight sort of... Um, taper sort of in it, so it was a little bit more angled, and this would help the ship cut through the sea a little bit more, and break the waves to the side of the ship rather than over the top of it, in theory. Um, this was also replaced, this was also uh, built along a new smokestack design for the ship to help disperse smoke to the left or to the right, and not over the back of the ship, especially over the back of the rear mast section. September 1949. After a new round of sea trials, the ship had just returned to the docks. Uh, the ship was hastily rearmed with live shells rather than the practice shells it was carrying at the time because Britain had just declared war. One day after the declaration, and a couple of days after the ship returning to port, a flight of Wellington bombers appeared, launched, uh, launching a raid on the ship and her port. No damage was actually done to the ship, and only minor damage to the port, but this was the ship's first taste of war and action, and luck of not being hit, well, it might not last. 21st of November 1939. Gneisenau and Scharnhorst were to work together. The sisters' history is rather entwined and linked together, especially at the start, and both ships left port to go on their first patrol, teamed with the cruiser Colm, along with nine escort destroyers. The convoy left port heading to Iceland and the Faroe Islands to patrol for merchant vessels, which was often the case at the time, along with trying to lure the British home fleet north to help protect Panzerschiff Grafsch Bay, uh, which was under pressure from the Allied capital ships in the Atlantic after some well, a little bit of commerce raiding, and the Allies really wanted to get rid of those ships in the Atlantic. 23rd of November 1939. Now we're just going to talk about a different ship for a moment, which is HMS Ralpindi, a former P&O cruise liner, uh, bought into the war effort by the Royal Navy as an armed merchant cruiser, converted for the cause by adding six aging pre-World War I breech-loaded 150mm guns, along with two 76mm guns on the bow and the stern of the ship. Uh, this ship was sent to patrol around Iceland and generally the Straits of Denmark just to look for German merchant vessels. 
She had success uh, by making German tanker Gunnison, um, a 4,500 ton tanker scuttle itself, uh, depriving the British of the oil, but depriving Germany of its vital fuel as well. Uh, being scuttled, the ship would be no use anymore and no longer make the trips from South America. However, this was the only success for the ship. On the 23rd of November, the ship responded to a possible enemy sighting. The ship had the dire misfortune of running into Germany's two most powerful battleships with their escorts. HMS Rolpindi nevertheless steamed towards the foe. The ship's sacrifice did lead to the position of the enemy forces being discovered, however. The German ship demanded the surrender of the hapless, outgunned merchant cruiser. However, the captain of the ship, Captain Edward Kennedy, uh, defiantly refused and closed into range for his guns to start firing. In a radio message he proclaimed, We'll fight them both. They'll sink us, and that will be that. Goodbye. The ocean liner opened up her guns and scored one hit on KMS Scharnhorst, causing minor splinter damage to the deck. Forty minutes after the Ralpindi opened fire, the two battleships had taken her down below the waves. However, the new Allied, the, the Allied capital ships were now on their way, knowing the position of the German convoy. HMS Hood, Nelson, Rodney and Francis Dunkirk steamed towards the German ships. This meant they had to speed a hefty, a hefty retreat uh, at full speed now to, across the high seas back to Germany. Going at full speed across the high seas, especially in the North Sea, is not a good idea because it's very rough up there. And this caused quite a lot of damage to the ships in some rough weather. Both had issues with the bow still, both had flooding issues. They required full dry docking while in repairs as well. This led to a second version of the bow being placed onto Gunai's now. A, uh, a new version again, this, this ship has gone through three bows now, so she's on her, well, she's on her third bow now, so... Hopefully they were hoping, well, they were hoping that this would solve the problems of the prior bow and make it a little bit easier. Uh, they made the sort of arch over the front of the ship a little bit steeper, made it a little bit sharper, so hopefully the waves would break either side of the ship. April 1940. The invasion of Norway and Denmark were underway. Named Operation Wesenboe, the two battleships were to provide cover for the landing forces. Aboard 14 destroyers and the cruiser Admiral Hipper, heading to Narvak and Trondheim, um, the journey was rather quiet, despite one flight of British bombers, uh, none, of the hips, none of the ships were hit. On the morning of the 8th of April, the ships had to split between the main forces and the landing forces. The ship, about 19 kilometres away, would stand guard, while the landing forces would charge the beachheads. Now, this was a good plan, however, a British destroyer stumbled across the landing forces as they came in. Combat began with the destroyer Z-11, Bernard von Arnim, and she had encountered HMS Glowworm, which tried in vain to fend off the, uh, the number in German ships. In a last-ditch effort, she went to ram the Admiral Hipper. Although she made contact with the ship, there was little damage made, and HMS Glowworm went beneath the waves. Despite the action being quite far away from the battleships, this meant they did have to go to full action stations, full battle stations, which may have helped the ships while they were set up in Vessenfjord, uh, able to provide cover for both landings, as now they were ready to go. At 4.30am, Gneisenau's Seekat radar, a system that had been used by the Germans and had a 19 kilometer range on it, this would allow also for better gunnery accuracy on the ships with a 50 meter dispersion pattern at full range, which is a very good uh, dispersion pattern as well as sort of accuracy as well. The radar had found the a ship. The radar, the radar operators quickly went about trying to work out what ship it was. Uh, they did manage to work out it was HMS Renown. 35 minutes into being found, 
HMS Renown fired the first ship shots. The British battle cruiser fired upon the Gneisenau. The first salvo, however, missed. Gneisenau didn't miss. She scored first blood. Uh, with two shells landing on the British ship, one failing to detonate, the second fragmenting on the British ship's deck. This caused some serious radio, radio damage, uh, which didn't really help the ship much. It was not long after that that uh, Renown's guns struck the German battleship as it started to fall back and begin a retreat. Two 380mm shells struck the rear of the ship, one hitting the director's tower and just going straight through, luckily not detonating, uh, but this did sever vital communication wires as well as cause the death of a few crewmen. The second hit the rear turret, so this meant that it disabled the sea turret uh, for the rest of the action. Although the two, British, the two battleships had the advantage with uh, the amount of guns they had, they did fear for a destroyer escort with the Renown uh, and their torpedoes of course. So both ships withdrew at full speed, escaping the British warships. This was not without consequence, however, as the bow issue reared its ugly head once more, causing flooding and damage to both ships, along with their A and B turrets. 12th of April 1940. Rejoined by the Hipper, the ships returned to Wilhelm uh, for repairs from the engagement with the Renown and more substantial damage caused by flooding, while in repairs and general, man uh, general maintenance was carried out too. This led to the ships uh, being laid up for almost a month. On the 5th of May, Gneisenau was to head to the Baltic Sea, uh, but being the ship that she was, i.e. the ship that just has to sail into everything and cause damage to itself, she managed to blunder her way into a mine, 21 metres off her port bow, uh, and this ended up causing quite a lot of damage, mainly just shock damage. Uh, a number of internal components were rattled out of their way and, de and destroyed or damaged. One of the turbines was also severely damaged, along with one rangefinder being almost completely unusable. Gneis now was in for repairs once more in a floating dry docking keel. 8th of June 1940, but this time both ships were back on the high seas. At 4pm, KMS Scharnhorst spots the aircraft carrier HMS Glorious with two escort destroyers. A rather odd sight considering the British fleet were usually sort of trying to stick together a little bit and a lone carrier blundering around with just a light escort in front of two of Germany's most advanced battleships at only 50 kilometers was a rather opportune target for them and very juicy indeed. A number of blunders can be accounted for HMS Glorious's uh, sinking. For unknown reasons, the British spot British ship spotted the two German capital ships uh, earlier. Uh, they'd actually made eyes on the smoke of the two ships at 3.46 p.m. HMS Acasta was sent to check out what they were. And with, with this happening, Glorious just continued on her doomed course. It took almost up to 30 minutes for her to start readying planes. And this was a little bit too late. Despite the closest ship being Scharnhorst, she actually had a boiler issue, which meant the Gnais now took the lead and started to unload the guns. Despite the escort destroyers trying to lay a smoke screen for the ships to get away, the guns were still very accurate due to the seat capped radar system, which allowed the Gnais now to lay her guns on HMS Glorious and sink her within an hour. The two battleships now turned their guns to the destroyers, which they swiftly dispatched. However, HMS Acasta had managed to launch a spread of torpedoes. Gneisenau now somehow managed to miss them, uh, which is odd for Gneisenau, now, but her sister ship, Scharnhorst, maybe feeling a little bit left out from being hit by things, ended up deciding to take a torpedo to the bow, uh, causing serious damage to the ship, meaning she'd have to go back to Kiel for repairs. 20th of June 1940. For 12 days at sea, Gneis now went without damage. She sailed with a small force of the Hipper and four destroyers towards Iceland to try and cause panic for the British to make them think that they were actually trying to head out to the Atlantic again, meaning their forces were not focused on the limping Scharnhorst. Uh, this plan was going extremely well, 
until submarine HMS Clyde released a 533mm torpedo into the path of the Gneisenau. Maybe feeling sympathy for the Scharnhorst, she set her course for the torpedo and took it to the bow and must have felt better about herself. The torpedo blew a hole in the bow, splintering just below the splinter belt, and had serious damage of flooding to the front section of the ship. This meant she had to limp back to Kiel, despite a large number of British uh, of the British flotilla uh, sent to try and take out the ships. They did actually fail to find the Gneisenau and the Scharnhorst, so both ships made it back to port. <coughs> January 1941. Finally repaired, the two sisters took part in some small sea trials to make sure everything was okay in ship shape. Unfortunately, a storm rolled in while they were out at sea. Scharnhorst, the well-behaved sister, was completely undamaged. But you know who, and you know where I'm going here, bow flooding repairs. Take 2. 22nd of January 1941. The two sisters left Poland and started to steam up and around Britain to start Operation Berlin. A commerce raiding trip to the Atlantic, the idea was that the two ships were to use their speed and radars to avoid the British home fleet, uh, who were deployed near Iceland to try and stop any German ships. A small moment of luck appeared for the German ships when a squall hit and hid the two ships, thus allowing them to break free on the 3rd of February. The ships sailed to Greenland and refueled. Shortly after leaving the tanker there, the two ships spotted their first convoy. However, this convoy was guarded by HMS Ramillies, and thus they were ordered not to engage. Now, the orders of engagement and the rules of engagement for the two German ships were to attack unguarded convoys or very lightly guarded convoys, not to attack any that had a British capital ship with them. Scharnhorst tried to lure the British capital ship away so Gneisenau could feast on the convoy, but it didn't work. The British ship stayed where it was, and the ships just had to give up. It was not until the 20th, 22nd of February that the two ships found an empty convoy, and their reign of terror could start. This lasted until around the 15th of March. In this time, the two ships managed to sink just over 107,000 tonnes of Allied merchant shipping, directed a pair of U-boats uh, in a raid on a, on a convoy guarded by a couple of capital ships, uh, and they managed to sink an extra 28,000 tonnes. They also acquired free tankers, netting them a nice amount of oil, as well as denying the enemy of oil as well. All of this was very successful. Uh, it was a good month for the cruise marine. However, their terror meant that the British had now sent some of their best ships to the Atlantic. Admiral Luchens decided it was best to return home and give the crew some shore leave and a little bit of rest for the ship, as well as getting you know some repairs and general maintenance done to the boats. This was done on the 22nd of March, just as the ships arrived in port. However, going to a port that's in France was not the best idea. The ships headed to Brest in France and decided that that was going to be the best spot for them. N not the best idea, as on the 30th of March 1941, hindsight would have been a great thing for them, and I'm sure the Admiral would have loved to have known that the British were going to send lots of bombers their way. Oddly enough, Two prized battleships being in a dry dock within range of British bombers was a likely an extremely bad idea. Within eight days, the first air raid hit. Five days later, a second came. Despite both ships being unharmed, the de dock decided to take the ships out of the vulnerable dry dock stage and place them into the harbour proper. Again, a hindsight would have been a great thing for them, because seemingly this is a good idea. Your ships aren't going to get bombed while in dry dock. However, the next day of the 6th of April, the ships now in nice, deep, wet water, in a stationary position, were the ideal target for Flying Officer Campbell, Victoria Crosswinner. Uh, the pilot flew his Bristol bow fort in, dropping a torpedo which would hit the Gneisenau. now. The Bristol Balfour and her crew were lost during the anti-aircraft fire. Being the drama queen that she was, Gneisenau of course took the torpedo. It struck just underneath sea turret, 
3,000 tons of water flooded the ship, along with severely damaging the propulsion system and side plating of armour. The ship was actually saved by a salvage tug that was close to hand, who managed to start pumping the ship as she started to list two degrees to starboard. Gnaizna, of course, being the hydrophobe she was, decided to go back to her safe place, which was dry dock. While these repairs were underway, numerous air raids caused issue. One of the worst was on the 10th of April, where the RAF dropped over 25 tonnes on the ship itself. Four of the bombs managed to strike. The superstructure and the deck armour were quite badly damaged, so the decision came to upgrade the ship while she was in for repairs. 14 20mm aircraft guns were now to adorn the ship. There were also changes in the way the catapult fighter was placed and how it would work as well. German command now had three ships in the Atlantic. The same Atlantic that the Royal Navy now seemingly owned. After the disaster which was KMS Bismarck's first voyage, Germany wanted to pull the ships back to Norway to allow the Luftwaffe to provide air cover, along with being able to, to fight to the Eastern Front, denying vital supplies to Russia. Operation Cerberus was a go. Now, just a little bit on the Bismarck. Uh, originally with the KMS Bismarck's voyage, she was going to be escorted by both Gneisenau and Scharnhorst. However, because both ships were so badly damaged, they couldn't get out to provide cover to the ship. Had this been the case, it could have been a different history altogether. The 11th of February 1942, the sister ships were joined by Prince Eugen uh, and they were going to go home. However, the route above Britain via the Atlantic and Iceland was no longer possible due to superior Royal Navy forces, which generally patrolled the, the top of the nation. No ship would be suicidal enough to run through the middle of the uh, channel, however, but it was completely full of mines. The RAF covered it, and radar would let the British know enemy ships were coming with such ease that they would never make it through the British Channel. So, of course, on the 11pm, the three ships started out their, their, their voyage, dashing through the British Channel. Leaving Brest, the Kriegsmarine had a stroke of luck. The British submarine tasked with guarding the port and reporting any movement from the enemy ships had to recharge its batteries, so it had left its position and managed to miss the sight of two giant battleships and a heavy cruiser leaving port. At 6.30 p.m. sorry, 6.30 a.m. of the 12th of February, the ships had passed Cherbourg. Hugging the French coast as closely as they could, the ships continued at full steam. A second stroke of luck for the Germans was the British failed to detect the minesweeping action that had been going on through the British Channel for the last week, meaning the ships had a pretty clean run as long as they stuck to the path. A flotilla of torpedo boats and the destroyer Zid-29 now joined the three ships to aid their passage. With this, on board the destroyer was the Luftwaffe's liaison officer, who was directing a large amount of fighter escorts all flying below radar level, by all accounts at mast level of the ships. Quite a sight to have seen, I imagine. This would have meant the escort fighters were not being detected by the RAF's aerial radar systems. As the ship passed through the channel, a number of German medium bombers were now flown over the ships. They were delivering a large amount of chaff to blind the radar operators along with the south coast of along the south coast of Britain. Although at 1 p.m. the radar operators nearly merely just needed to walk outside of their radar office, look across the Dover Strait, and they would have seen a group of battleships, a destroyer, and a heavy cruiser steaming past them. 1.30 p.m. A flight of six fairy swordfish flew a suicidal mission to try and torpedo the convoy. Despite having a small amount of fighter escorts, the planes were no match for the firepower of the Luftwaffe, who had created a protection to protective screen across the naval uh, the naval convoy. 4.17 p.m. Five British destroyers on manoeuvre and live fire practice spotted the enemy ships and were ordered to engage them and launch a torpedo screen at the fleeing German ships. The old World War I destroyers, however, were no match, nor were they capable of closing the gap to the German flotilla, 
and were unable to launch their torpedoes. HMS Worcester was one of the unfortunate ships to get close enough, thus being targeted by Gneisenau and Prince Eugen, who unleashed a salvo and wiped out the majority of the ship. Some miracle, however, meant the ship was still floating and had a boiler somewhat operating. The ship managed to limp back to port. At 5.55pm, Gneisenau, now, now having outrun the British destroyers, survived the aerial attacks and made it to somewhat friendly ocean territory, uh, was thinking that this mission had gone far too smoothly and thus seeked to out a mine so it could get some damage to it. Although this just caused minor flooding, uh, he did manage to shake one of the central turbines enough to make it stop working. The ship limped to a stop, now in safish waters, and repaired the damage herself. Thus, on 4am of the 13th of February, the ships had returned and set sail for Kiel. Of course, we're not done here on this part of the story, because, well, due to a thick ice in the canal that goes to Kiel, the ships stopped in Brunsbattel, and Gneisenau now being Gneisenau, now, she just had to do something dumb. Managing to strike the wreck of a sunk ship, she managed to tear a hole in her hull and caused some flooding damage. Well done, Gneisenau. now. Well done. Well done. You just you just managed to keep surprising us. Only she could manage to do this. The following day they reached Kiel, and back to the dry dock she went. 26th of February 1942. The ship was repaired, polished and ready to go. Uh, the ship had been in dry dock for a, a fair amount of her time and now had moved to a semi-floating a semi dry dock. She was now fully loaded and restocked and ready to head to Norway on the 6th of March and cause some trouble for the British convoys there. The ship was being readied for a short round of sea trials before setting sail and everything was looking good. That is until that night. The British launched a heavy air raid on Kiel, and especially Gneisenau. One bomb penetrated the armoured deck and detonated. Fragmentation of the bomb landed in a turret, the red hot shards igniting the propellant charges. This caused a huge explosion, launching an 800 ton turret into the air and off its mount, along with blowing most of the bow in half. The rest of the bow was destroyed by fire damage. A quick thinking couple of crew members managed to flood the magazines which prevented a full detonation of the ship, saving possibly hundreds if not or nearly a thousand of lives in the action. The extent of the damage sunk in the next day in daylight, the ship would need a whole new bow section and it was decided that the ship would be upgraded fully while in repairs and now equipped with six 380mm guns, and on the 4th of April headed to Gothland, Poland. 1943. Although the new bow was attached to the Gneisenau and almost fully repaired, it had come too late to save the battleship. Hitler had decided that, well, the surface fleet was going to be scrapped to make more U-boats. This was then the way to win the war with new wonder weapons. Due to the numerous naval defeats, the German high seas fleet and high command were not in the best of speaking terms. However, Admiral Donitz, the commander of the U-boat fleet, did manage to save the surface fleet that remained. However, a terrible fate had become Gneisenau's, and she was not going to get remade. Her 280mm main guns and 150mm secondary guns ended up as parts of the shore defence network. The giant turrets sitting in fortresses along, along the Norwegian coastline. There is actually one of these still remaining. Sea turret still remains in Osterat Fort, uh, which is in Norway. Uh, it's now made into a museum. Due to the gun being active until the late 1960s, uh, it's still in remarkable condition and well worth a look if you manage to get that. It, it's a museum that I would love to visit. It looks very, very interesting. Despite the horrors of its creation, it's an interesting place to look at. I always say with these videos, just remember the horrors that come along with these things. When we're talking about damage and guns and things like that, they are made to destroy people, to ruin people, to kill people. And 
And that's the part of history that is very hard to swallow, but you do have to look at the whole part of history. The hull of the unfortunate sister ship was towed out to the harbour mouth and scuttled, becoming a blockade to stop the advancing Red Army. The hulk was eventually reflated in 1951. Uh, this was actually the largest reflotation of a ship until that time. They towed the hulk out and scrapped her. Now, much of the metal from the ship ended up being used in, well, believed to be used in Polish merchant ships. So there might be some bits of Gnaiz now still afloat today. And well, that brings an end to this episode. A bit of a long waffly one, I know. Uh, but I hope you've enjoyed this video and the new little bit of a new format. If you did, let me know in the comments below. I'd love to get some feedback on this one. Uh, and if you've enjoyed this video, please feel free to subscribe to the channel. I'd love to get to a thousand subscribers soon, uh, because I think that will help the channel grow a bit. But nonetheless, if you do subscribe, thank you so much. Uh, you will be getting more of this historical content on the way at some stage. If you've also enjoyed the sort of chat and things like that, feel free to join the Discord as well. There are a few people like, uh, like me in there, and we do love to waffle on and chatter a bit. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and I will catch you all next time. Bye-bye.